Okay, welcome everyone to my continuation of what are my favorite theorems. As usually, right, my favorite theorems. So, uh, very bi biased point of view. Yeah, so today's topic is actually uh, not called a theorem, but a problem. But um, the problem has a known solution, and that is basically the theorem I'm going to talk about. Anyway, so it's a very classical and uh, well known problem from group theory. It's called Burnside's problem. It's one of those questions that have a really, really easy uh, formulation. And it, it looks like there should be an easy answer, but it turns out the answer is, is not very easy, but very interesting. Um, yeah, so let's just jump right into it. So the question, basically Bernstein's problem is the following question. Um, so take a group and every element uh, of your group has a certain order, right? Remember an order was just uh, the, the minimal k such that let's say a is my element, a to the k is a, is a trivial element. So and k is infinite, if there is no k then you call k infinite and you say it's of infinite order. And you would have some, well, some very basic observations. So in a finite group, every element is of finite order. Well, why is that? Well, basically because um, every element of infinite order spends a free group in one generator, which is Z, right? So one is of infinite order in Z because I can, well, confusing, but Z is written additively, not multiplicatively anyway, but you can add one as often, often as you want and it will never be zero, right? So that, that would be an all element of finite order in Z. There is no such element. So um, one is for example of infinite order, and if I don't call my element one, but A, then any element of infinite order actually spans uh, Z. Okay, so you have those two observations. You know a lot of finite groups and in all finite groups, all elements are finite order. And you know that every element of infinite order will definitely span uh, an infinite subgroup of your group. Very good. And then you go on and you have some, well, some list of infinite groups and you just look at them like Z, that's what we just discussed or free groups um, or something like matrix groups or break groups, uh, infinite Coxeter groups, something like that. They were all known to Burnside in, huh, well, something like 120 years ago. And he observed that in all of these groups, I find an element of infinite order, right? So he, he, he knows that as soon as you have an, group, an element of infinite order, your group is infinite. But why should the converse be true, right? He just looked at some examples and realized in all examples I know, uh, there is at least some element of infinite order. Not all elements have infinite order. For example, um, certainly in, in, in GL2, you can have an element of finite order, let's say like this one. This is a finite order. Why? Because if you multiply it with itself, you get the identity and that's so it's the actual order two. Uh, but you also have an element of infinite order in this group, right? In break groups, you, for example, have also inf elements of infinite order. So he, he looked at this list of examples and in not a non-example, he, he was not able to find a single example where ele every element has finite order, except the group was already finite. Okay, so he just asked exactly the, the question you would ask in this case, is there an infinite group where every element has finite order? And it turns out that the answer is yes, which I find very surprising, like every element has finite order, the answer is yes, um, it's a bit, a bit surprising. Um, and, but it also turns out that it took a very long time. So it's absolutely not obvious. So uh, something like 62 years, but I will show you a, a different solution, which is, which is even younger. So it goes back to the eighties. Um, uh, so I show you a group actually where every element is a, has order a power of two, uh, but the group is still infinite. And this whole uh, video was inspired by a very nice block linked in the description where they prove that this is actually true. So I won't show you the proof. The proof isn't too bad. As I said, the blog proves it, um, but it's maybe too much for a video. 
Anyway, I will show you the group and how to construct it. And along the way, I will show you a very nice machinery to construct groups, which isn't as well known as it deserves to be. Namely, I will show you how to construct uh, groups from automata. Uh, so before we jump to the next slide where I'll explain to you what an automata is, let me just say that Burnside's question, it's, so, so this Burnside's question or Burnside's problem, whatever you want to call it, is um, one of the most prominent uh, questions in group theory. It was discussed by many authors. There are many, nowadays, many solutions known and many approaches. And there are also many different versions of Bernstein's conjecture. So I linked to you in the description the history of Bernstein's conjecture. It's, it's kind of a little bit funny to read. And also a various different formulation of Bernstein's conjecture. I just took the easiest one kind of because this is a video and I would like to discuss something easy. Um, but you can ask similar question, which are a little bit fancier. So before, you, before we go to the uh, next slide, let me just briefly mention why this finitely generated condition here kicks in. Basically, because I, if I wouldn't have this condition, I could take something like an uh, infinite product of Z mod twos, and then certainly element, element has uh, finite order, but it, it's basically infinite by definition. It's kind of a silly example, and we want to exclude that. Um, so, so just finitely generated just means you have a finite number of generators. Um, and it, it's just a condition otherwise. So this example was certainly known to Burnside. Uh, so he already has this finitely generated condition. Anyway, so the point is I will show you this group where every element is of finite order, which is still infinite, which I find a very puzzling property. But maybe more importantly, I will show you a machinery to construct nice groups. So let's have a look at this machinery. And <laughs> so I will model everything on this thing, on a turnstile. Um, <laughs> and okay, not quite, on an automata describing the turnstile. And what is an automata? Basically an automata is a labeled graph. So here is my example of an automata. I have two nodes, I have two vertices, which I call L. So here's L and which I call U, here's U, so this is U, this is L. And you should think that L means our little turnstile here is locked and U, no, let's, let's do U in a different color. Um, and U means our little uh, turnstile is unlocked. Okay, uh, that's not very interesting so far, but it's a graph. So a graph also has edges and this graph has labeled edges. And the labels for my edges are either C or P, which I call my alphabet. And um, P should be read as push and C should be read as coin. And then I have this graph here, which basically means, okay, um, my turn style is in a locked state L and it's in a locked state and I can push as much as I want and it will still be in a locked state. So that's why I have this error here labeled P, uh, which is, which is a, a loop on the vertex L, right? I push, 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 push. I can do it as often as I want. I write a word in the, my alphabet, P, 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 and my state doesn't change. And state is just the name in this case for um, the vertex. My I'm still in state L. I can push as much as I want. I should at least put a coin at one point because then I can hop to the unlocked state. Okay, so now it's unlocked. Great, what, what can I do? I can put more coins if I want to. I could do that, it's pretty silly, but I could. Um, and as you can see, the, the coin edge is still looping back to, 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 the, to the same state. So I, it stays unlocked. I can put as many coins <laughs> into my turnstile as I want to, it stays unlocked. But what I can do now is I can push and then I jump back to the difference, to the other state. And this whole thing is called an automata because it kind of describes the automata of a turnstile in this case, right? It's just a labeled graph and you have states. These are your vertices. You have uh, basically a transition. These, these are your edges. And um, yeah, a transition can take you from one state to the other. And this, will, this is a very, very kind of very useful concept. And, something in mathematics and logic 
and computer science called automata theory. And um, the surprising thing is that you can use it pretty general in a pretty general context. For example, to create groups. That's what I'm going to show you next. Just recall uh, or remember that the automata is nothing fancy, uh, at least in mathematics. It's just a, a graph with labels for the vertices, which you call states, labels for the edges, which you basically call transitions. Um, yeah, so let's go. Let's take the, 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 same, the same automata, basically. I, I need to make it a bit fancier in order to create a group, or in this case, actually a semi-group to be precise. So semi-group here just means I don't have an identity. I, I will have an identity on, uh, in my next example, but for this example, I just, I just decided I don't need an identity anyway. Anyway, just, just raffle, it just doesn't matter so much. Um, the, the only difference or the main difference between this thing and this thing is that I've slightly changed my edge labels. Now my edge labels are actually functions, if you want. Now my edge labels are a C, C to C, a P to P, a P to C, and a C to P. But otherwise, it's exactly the same thing. And now I can, now why do I want to do this? Well, because now I can think of my L and U as being functions. So L is a function from words to words. Um, from words to words. And words are, of course, words in my alphabet. And my alphabet was, um, well, P and C. And U, uh, so L. Uh, and, and U, of course, in, in exactly the same way. And how does it work? Well, whatever. Blah, blah, blah. And how does it work? Well, it works as follows. So um, I would like to, I, I take a word. So let's take a word. Here's my word. That's the word I want to take, P, P, C, P. And L should set it to something which I need to determine. And how does it work? Well, I start, uh, it's illustrated here. So let me do it on the graph upstairs. So um, it works as follows. I start at L and I look, I, I walk along the edge P which brings me back to L and at the same time fixes P, okay? Um, okay, first letter is done. Then I go to P, I, I walk along the edge P and I see what happens, so it goes to P. Good, next thing is done. Then I look at C, I walk along the edge C, so I now go to the different state and I look what the edge C is telling me, so I keep it. And then I have a P again and I walk back but now P, uh, the edge tells me to change P to C. So uh, this was the map on the set of words that sends the word PPCP to PPCC. And for any other word I can, and for any other word I can read off in exactly the same way, by just following the graph, um, well, what kind of result it is. So L actually is a map in this case, on the set of words. And to determine it, that's what I just explained, you just look at the, at the automata, at the graph, and you follow the rules on the graph. Similarly, um, if you want to do it, so here, the PPCP actually goes to CPCC if you start at U. So let's see whether we can see this. So um, again, PPCP, and you just walk along. So first you walk this way, so you set it to C, then you have an edge fixing it, you send it to P, um, then comes to C, you go to here, send it to C, then comes to P, you go back, send it to C. So it goes to C, P, C, C. And because these are now maps on a certain set, they basically generate a group. Um, because, okay, you would need to check that there are automorphisms, you know, so they're invertible and there's a unit. In this case, there is no unit. So they strictly speaking generate a semi-group. The difference doesn't matter whether you want to talk about a semi-group or a group, no big difference. Um, anyway, so this is a very, very, very nice method to generate semi-groups or groups, whatever you want. Um, just fix your favorite graph, give it some rules, um, this is automata, and get going to create functions on, on the alphabet that you've chosen. And yeah, you 
you have created a group or a survey group, whatever it is. And that's a really powerful idea, I think. And in particular, it applies to the Burnside problem. And this is absolutely not obvious. So the first, I actually don't know when the first, um, so this is a, called a group generated by an automata, or let me just go to the next slide, uh, generated by what is called a Mealy machine, uh, named after a person called Mealy, link in the description. Um, because it's not quite an automata, because you have those funny rules uh, associated to edges. Anyway, um, I, I don't actually know, that's what I wanted to say. I don't actually know when the first group was constructed using an automata, but it turned out to be a really, really powerful ideal, uh, uh, idea. <laughs> In particular, um, what I'm going to explain to you uh, is this group that we already, already see here on the slide, which is called Grigor Shuk's first group. So um, the first one he constructed or a, a version of the first one he constructed. And it has many, many, many funny properties that you can actually read off from the kind of the combinatorics of the graph. Um, I won't go too into details, but the link is in the description. And the property we are interested in is that you can show, again, the link in the description does it. So um, the, the block that this thing is infinite, which is not quite clear, but it's also not so hard. Um, and that every element is a finite order. So this group, so this one up here that is generated by exactly in the same way as I did it on, on the previous slide by this, by this um, finite state automata or this mealy machine, whatever you want to call it, that is a group um, that, well, solves Burnside's question because it is infinite, but every element is finite order. Actually element is of, uh, of, of order two to the K for some K. And I think that's pretty amazing. I mean, that this is even true is pretty amazing, as I said, and that the construction is actually so simple. So here, it's, it's, so here I have a unit. So this state is a unit. How can you see that this is a unit? No, well, the only, uh, only edge is, well, the only two edges are loops and both of them just tell you zero stays zero and one stays one. So here my alphabet, I haven't said it, it is one zero, of course. So I write down any word in one zero, one zero, one zero, whatever. And I look what, uh, whatever uh, A is doing to this thing. So what is A doing? Well, just have a look at A, I start here. So my first rule says I swap one and zero and then I end at the, at the trivial state anyway. So this just swaps, A just swaps the first uh, the first element you see and keeps everything else. So A, A is a very easy operation. Yeah, but maybe the more visually appealing is um, to think of this group as the automorphisms of a binary tree. So what is a binary tree? Well, this is a binary tree and it works as follows. So a binary tree is just, it, you just split uh, in two different ways at each, at each vertex starting at some root. And the way to create words is, of course, um, you just choose a direction. So whenever you go left, you put a zero. Whenever you go right, you put a one. So this is a zero, one, zero, one, whatever. And so you, each vertex actually corresponds to a word. And now you can read off uh, the action of A, for example, is the automorphism. Uh, so A is a function that takes a word and produces a word again in zero one. So it is actually an automorphism of this tree. And which one is it? Well, it just swaps those two um, branches of the tree because of the simple rule that from A you swap and then you fix, then, then you stay as identity, so you're fixed. The others are a little bit more elaborate as you can see, but they're not too bad. So this group is actually uh, a subset of the automorphism of the symmetries of, the, of, of a binary tree which is a pretty nice uh, activity description. But uh, combinatorially, it's just obtained from this um, uh, mini machine or this automata, whatever you want to call it. Yeah, um, that's it for today. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, let me repeat what we have seen. We have seen this Burnside problem, which is to me a very surprising, well, the, the problem is, uh, the answer is very surprising that it actually works. So an infinite group where every element is of finite order, and the way to produce such a group, at least the one I showed you today, is to use an automata. And that's a very, very powerful idea 
to generate uh, groups. So um, if you really want to have a look at this Grigorsho group, the link is in the description, uh, Wikipedia lists a lot of funny properties of this group. Originally, it was used um, not to prove the Burnside conjecture, well, it, or the, the Burnside problem, not to solve the Burnside problem. It does solve the Burnside problem, but there was a reference something like 20 years before. No, it, it was more about, um, uh, about sub-exponential growth in groups. Anyway, there's a lot of interesting properties and people have generated many, many, many interesting groups for using this idea of, um, of, of using a, a melee machine or a finite state automata. Yeah, but I still hope or <laughs> I hope that you enjoyed the video and uh, I also hope to see you next time.